it's with great pleasure that uh, I introduce to you Missy Cummings. Missy is Associate Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics and Director of the Humans and Automation Lab at MIT. And uh, she's going to talk about her research on human unmanned vehicles and what is the potential impacts of that on healthcare and medical equipment and technology in healthcare. And she is a former US Navy fighter pilot, so don't mess around with her. Let me see, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Hello, so um, I'm here with the people who managed to brave it to the end of the conference, so I always feel like, you know, if you get to this point, I should be handing out some kind of uh, prize or a reward for staying this far. Uh, you know, it's funny, I've been sitting in the back of the room most of the, um, uh, some of the morning and the afternoon, and I, my PhD is in systems engineering, and it, this isn't the first time I've been around the medical community, but it, it's always amazing to me just how desperate the healthcare community is for good systems engineering practices, which are well-known, uh, pro the processes, the quality control, reliability, all the issues that, that healthcare wants, and it's just, it's kind of, it's, it's just a sad statement that, that the whole industry is kind of resistant to that, and we can talk a little bit later after why I think that is, but I actually, I believe that the root cause is, comes back to, um, at least in the U.S., some funding agents, agency resistant to actually believing that that's a, a scientific field. But let me get off that soapbox and step back and say, I'm here to talk to you about the future of robotics and healthcare. And as Max said, okay, let's see if this works. There we go. As Max said, this was my life before I became an academic. I'm one of the rare academics that actually uh, lived and worked in the real world before I went into academia. Frankly, I don't know how professors at MIT become professors without first being a fighter pilot because I find that that's a, that's a requisite skill set that's really helped me a lot uh, at that school. So this is, uh, if, if you can't tell, if you don't know what this is, this is the back of an aircraft carrier. And this is one of the skills that I learned while I was in the Navy. But while I was in the Navy, I saw two technologies coming online in two different parts of the Navy that actually made, gave me pause and made me sit back and kind of rethink where I was going with my life. And uh, the first one was in, the, uh, in your upper left, that is an F-18 Hornet. And I flew A-4 Skyhawks first, which if you've ever seen the movie Top Gun, it's the little aggressor, uh, the adversary plane in Top Gun which is a real man's plane. It's a fly, uh, you fly it yourself. There's no special electronics in that plane. And then I shifted to the F-18 Hornet, which is what you're seeing there. And it's basically an all electric plane flown all by computers. And the human is just there to supervise the computer to make sure that the computer's doing everything right. The one thing that this plane can do that is eye-watering is that it can always land itself on the aircraft carrier better, always better than the pilot always more precisely, uh, always, with a, always catches a wire, even in bad weather. And it's very difficult when you're being told, and it's, it's definitely a form of brainwashing in the Navy, that you're better than everyone else on the planet, especially Air Force pilots, uh, because you can land on an aircraft carrier and uh, no one else can. And so you really believe that. And that's why most fighter pilots, particularly Navy fighter pilots, are really obnoxious to be around because we really do believe that we're better than everyone else, except the computer. And that's kind of a hard pill to swallow at first. And then that was in the aviation side of the Navy. Uh, at, at that time, which was the mid-1990s, on the other side of the Navy, the seagoing Navy, they were developing the Tomahawk missile, which is what you see in the bottom corner. And this is a missile that can be fire, fired 1,000 miles from its target, potentially underwater. That one's being fired out of a submarine. And it always has a meter or less precision to its target. The Tomahawk missile always hits its intended target. That's not true of humans. And that's not true of human pilots. And at that time, the Tomahawk missile was just a seagoing. And, well, and today, it still is. But I actually understood at that time, it's probably the only time I've actually been able to read the tea leaves correctly, that this missile, 
has very precise technology and it was going to, at that time it was going to incorporate GPS technology. I knew that that same technology for that weapon was going to be merged at some point with the plane, uh, the computer that could always land itself better, and I knew that we would have unmanned vehicles, aerial vehicles. I knew that I was going to be out of a job when I saw those two technologies, and this was about 20 years ago. And pretty much that's come true. Uh, about a year ago, it became safer for the military to send an unmanned aerial vehicle out on a bomber fighter mission than it for a manned fighter. And Israel has announced that within 40 years that all fighters and bombers will be unmanned. So you are actually, it's hard for people to realize, and believe me, the um, American Pilots Association hates my guts because they, they see where I'm going with this. You know, one day pilots, as we know them, will be gone. And it's, it's hard for us to get our, our minds around it. But, you know, that's, and then we think, well, that's just this field. It could never happen in healthcare. Oh, yes, and I, and I, I wanted to remind you, you're all flying on a UAV, by the way. Airbus, uh, every Airbus plane is computer controlled. Every Airbus plane actually technically could be flown by this little smartphone. This is one of the um, things that made me famous in my lab is we were able to distill an entire ground control station, basically a cockpit, into your smartphone and show that anybody with three minutes of training could basically fly any UAV. And the technology exists today to hook that smartphone up to that plane and then you could be the pilot, right? So uh, we're, you're actually not that far. And I would actually say, being over in Europe, uh, it's clearly Airbus has led the way in automated technologies in the air. Now, let me explain to you a little bit about what I do, and, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit right now about where you're gonna see a lot of these technologies, both in and out of healthcare, just to kind of base you in, you know, where are we in the world of automated technology? So I do, my research is called Human Supervisory Control, and it's really where we have humans on the loop versus in the loop. Humans are watching what the computer is doing and make sure the computer is doing everything okay, uh, but it's not in the active control loop themselves. And in this case, you're seeing a UAV that's being controlled by a computer, but the human's watching it. But you'll also see uh, forklifts now. Anybody ever wonder why when you're shopping at Amazon at 3 o'clock in the morning and you order something at like 3.15, you get a message that says it's on its way? Am I the only one that's shopping at 3 a.m.? I know I'm not. <laughs> Uh, so what happens is in these warehouses, it's completely automated, and you should go watch a YouTube video of Kiva Systems, K-I-V-A, if you want to see these little robots in action and how well that they can do this package delivery process. This robot is actually one step above that. This was developed for the U.S. Army, where it goes into a field that's potentially under hostile fire, and these robotic forklifts can deliver goods uh, in fields, mud, sand um, with potentially under fire. So that's coming. In a small corner all the way around the other side of the earth in Australia, mining is being turned over to robots. This is a mining dump truck. Uh, it's, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little person. My student is right there. Can you see? And that's how big they are. And these trucks are so well behaved, they, they so precisely execute their job of getting in iron ore or mud and dirt, whatever, and then dumping it where they're supposed to, that they actually cut grooves in the, the packed dirt roads, that they actually have to start programming some randomness in them because they're so precise that they continue to go over the same path over and over again. And the, of course, mining uh, general managers, they love these things because they can't get enough people in the mines in Australia to work them. And when they can, you know, they, they like to fight at the bars on Friday night, and you know, you just don't have that problem with robots in the field. Here in Europe, you'll see a lot of automated trains. This is actually, it's, it's shocking and sad for the people in the United States to, they, they, the United States is really holding on to hard that we will always need a human in our train to drive us around. And when you tell people, you know, there are other parts of the world where you actually get in trains and there's not a human control in them, you're shocked and appalled. So, in fact, this was a, a, re, a picture from a research project I was doing with Alstom in France. And then, 
last but not least, probably my, my most favorite application today, because I think it's, it's probably the scariest of all these applications, are the driverless cars. This is a Google car, but they're not the only ones. Mercedes is jumping into that game, Lexus, all the high-end manufacturers. We need to be taken off the road. We are terrible drivers, particularly Americans, awful, awful drivers. Uh, so we'll all be safer when we get ourselves off the road. The problem with driverless cars are the sensor technology is just not quite there yet. We're not quite ready for prime time. And so we are now in what I call the American Bar Association's most happy times, or any legal association's happy times, because we're actually starting to deploy aspects of driverless car technologies like automated cruise control, and we're gonna to start to have a lot of accidents. Why should you care in the healthcare community? Because it's an interesting legal paradigm to watch to see who's gonna be held responsible when accidents start to happen, and they, and they already have started to happen. Okay, so that's everywhere else in the world, so, so that you can see that, in fact, we are quite advanced uh, everywhere else, and including in healthcare. You know, I, I love the telepresence robot because it gets a lot of airplay in the healthcare community, but those of you who are in the know know, you know, it's actually not that useful. It's really just an iPad on wheels, and so anywhere where you could take an iPad, you know, you effectively could have that same representation. But we like the idea of telepresence. I would say that's, in terms of robotics, that's about as low, lowest on the scale that you can get. It's really primitive. Telepresence and, and the use of those robots is, you know, it's a, it's a weekend project for students in the advanced universities. One of the more interesting uses of robots that I have seen, in, in the middle top up there, anybody know what that is? Very impressive, the pharmaceutical robots, right? So this is yet another field of highly skilled, highly trained people that are now finding themselves potentially facing extinction, extinction because the robots do such a far better job. You know, they don't need fringe benefits, vacation, all the other things that go around them. So I, I think that you're gonna see a lot more of these coming online. In the upper right, I'm sure everyone in here knows Da Vinci. You know, we could spend the entire day talking about Da Vinci. Da Vinci is, it's a great idea. There are definitely some um, very, very good uses. Although, you know, Da Vinci has, it's one of those technologies, I, I like to compare Da Vinci to the Google car. It's a great idea, and one day when it becomes a mature technology, it will revolutionize the way we do business. We're still not quite there yet in terms of mature technology, and by mature, I mean it's just a technology that that we have standards in place and we can guarantee 10 to the minus six, or in the aviation world, 10 to the minus ninth reliability. We're not there yet. That doesn't mean we shouldn't use it, but we just need to understand that surgical robots are, we're really, if we, if we were to think about a level of maturity, we're still kind of in first grade on surgical robots, and so their uses are going to become more and more important, and they are gonna get better over time as we start getting better sensors and computation online. One of the examples that I like to show down on your lower left is, uh, this is tumor ablation. Tumor ablation at the push of a button. So we're actually kind of making the leap from the teleoperation, which is happening in Da Vinci, to more of this is where we're going humans in the loop there, but this is more humans on the loop where you're letting the tools guide you and then functionally letting the system do most of the work. And then most of you are probably aware of the Qualcomm tricoder contest, you know, with that Star Trek tricoder that scans their body and detects illness. And this is a $10 million prize on the line. And there's nothing like $10 million to really motivate people. Um, I just did a stint as a government program manager. I was helping the government on a robotics helicopter project, and I'll show you a picture from that in a second. But there is a lot of serious interest in this. And while we are not going to have the Star Trek tricoder in this form anytime soon, within our lifetimes, we will see some big leaps in this kind of technology. And then over there, I think one of the most interesting uses of a submarine, as I, a person who used to be in the Navy and could not stand submarines, making little tiny submarines to go into your blood vessels to um, help detect and diagnose and treat uh, strokes. This is, this is definitely up and coming, the nano revolution. And so when we start to see this constellation of technologies, you start to think, wow, where are we going in the future? And, and it is, it's going to be an amazing future, but I will tell you we are making very, very slow progress in this area, particularly in the United States. And one of the reasons uh, that is is because the National Institutes of Health, which is the United States' primary funding arm, doesn't take this seriously. 
their robotics funding program is laughable, actually. It, it's really embarrassing that we don't fund robotics medical research more than we do. And this is where the companies are picking up the slack because as a nation, we're not funding it. Now, I'm not familiar enough with the EU policies to know, you know how they rank out, but I'm guessing it has to be better because it can't be any worse. All right, so let me explain to you then, when I look in my crystal ball, how do I know when and where technology is gonna come online? I mean, how can I, how can I tell what's gonna be automated and what's not? And, and really, when I talk to, talk to this, I think people always identify it as, am I gonna lose my job? I mean, we're robots in my job. So here's how I propose it stacks out. There, in the, in the world of cognitive science, we, we talk about there are three kinds of reasoning behaviors that you as a human do. You do skill, rule, and knowledge-based behavior. Skill-based behavior is something that you have to become, you have to practice a lot to become, uh, so that the skill becomes highly automatic without you thinking of it. When you drive, when you first learn how to drive, you have to tell yourself to stay between the two white lines on the road, but after a couple of hours of driving, it's so well rehearsed and it's such an easy skill to pick up that you don't have to tell yourself anymore for the rest of your time driving. For pilots, Skill-based reasoning is actually keeping the plane in level flight. At first, when you're learning, you spend hours and hours, probably you know, a good 100 hours just learning to keep the aircraft in balanced flight. Then once you do that, it becomes second nature. You don't really have to think about it anymore. And when we think about medical systems, skill-based reasoning is really what we're doing with something like uh, da Vinci. We're augmenting, we're letting a surgeon theoretically um, enhance his skills through that device. We're not automating it yet, we're only enhancing it. Now rule-based reasoning is one where you learn to take a set of rules and you program your behavior accordingly. You know that in the US, you know, when you see the red octagon sign, you're going to start slowing down and braking 30 feet before and theoretically your wheels will lock. Uh, mine never do, actually. Uh, so, uh, but for rule-based reasoning in the medical community, you can think of, well, these are checklists, right? Checklists are starting to come online. They've been there for a long time in the aviation community. One of the interesting things that I personally saw while I was working with the government is this device called the Automated Critical Care System. This is a device that ha is in its maybe second prototype. Now, it depends on how you want to define prototype. The idea is that you will be able to take this box, which is about this big, into the field where anyone can stick it up to a wounded soldier on the field and it will automatically take care of fluid management, potentially oxygen management. So this is a critical care life support device that will not require extensive medical training to operate. You really just plug it up to a person and then let them go with it. And then the idea is, is that now that we move up to knowledge-based reasoning, knowledge-based reasoning is when you have to start to take into account uncertainty not really sure, there's not a clear set of rules. And this is, of course, what happens a lot in emergency medicine. You, there, you can't really operate by any particular rule book, particularly in major trauma situations. And so you have to rely on a lot of intuition and judgment. So in terms of automation, it's actually a lot easier to automate skills because we know what those skills are. If we can sense it and we can get some feedback and we can measure what, how we've done on that set of skills, then we can automate it. This is why, this is what Airbus did. This, it's easy to automate the pilot in terms of keeping the airplane in level flight because we know exactly how to sense it and how to put the feedback back into the system to correct for any errors. Rules, you can think of as algorithms. If you can, if you can uh, speak about it in an if-then-else paradigm, then you can program that if-then-else. It's not until we get to knowledge and expertise, and expertise is basically when you start to bring the long-term strategic planning and the wisdom into understanding you know, the long-term effects of what you're doing. So if I were to say in terms of automation, we're pretty good up to this point. We can automate a lot of this, but up here is still anybody's game, and that's why I've sh shown this uncertainty line. As it grows, it becomes more and more difficult for, particularly for sensors, especially in today's world, to reason under uncertainty. How to make sense of, like for example, the Google car. Doesn't really do a good job in rain. Hmm. Does really great in Southern California, where it's nice and sunny, and the weather's pretty certain, but when, in, and when it starts to get foggy, rainy, precipitation, snow, forget it, people in Michigan will not have this thing for a long time. 
So now, but I wanted to tell you about some of the latest research, particularly in the medical world, that's starting to try to push the, that boundary, try to push over into how much can we automate into the knowledge-based reasoning. So this is a picture of a system in, a, in the United States. This is what I was working on, where it's um, a helicopter. It is specifically being designed to be, to be operated from your smartphone. There's a soldier in the field who has an emergency medical need maybe a bullet wound to the chest, and you know, his buddy next to him brings up and calls this emergency helicopter. Helicopter has no pilot on board, no medic on board. The helicopter has that, the automated critical care system on board, and potentially this, the robot that can go pick up a wounded soldier um, by itself, goes to the field, retrieves the person. They get, you know, maybe the robot retrieves this person, and uh, they, they can hook them up to the automated cr uh, critical care system and then hit go, and then the helicopter takes itself, navigates itself, and gets itself to the trauma unit. This is a vision, by the way. Don't, nobody get, no, you know, all the EMTs out there shouldn't get too scared. Their job is not gonna be automated anytime soon. But when I say it's a vision, it's a vision that's pretty far along in reality. I mean, all these pictures that you see, these right here, these are real pictures. This is a real robot that it's not actually a real, soldier, it's, it's, it's a dummy. But these are projects in development right now. This helicopter will fly for, for the first time in February or March of next year. So it's coming, and it, I mean, it literally is going to, somebody's going to have an iPhone or an Android and be able, to, uh, be, be able to command this thing from a smartphone. So we're making a lot of progress, and we can start to see the borderline starting to, to blur there because for the helicopter, it's, it's got to be able to land in any condition. So it's got to be able to land in any weather. It's got to be able to land on this hillside. And that's one of the reasons we show that in the picture. Because for humans, human pilots, it's actually very difficult to land in these extreme environments. And then if you actually start thinking about, you know, then when we plug up a person to these automated critical care systems and whether or not there's a robot retrieving this person, you know, there's actually... Picking up a wounded person, there's actually a lot more uncertainty than you would imagine. Well, probably not this crowd would imagine, but you have to actually think a lot about neck injury and other things, and how would you assess that? And this is where the, the Qualcomm tricoder comes in, because we're going to need some of these devices to actually enable these technologies to be a, a reality. But it's in the works. So as much as I've told you, I mean, this is all future vision. This is great. Uh, but why aren't, we th why aren't we there today? We're, we're having some problems. Okay, this is a project that a friend of mine, uh, Sanjeev Singh at Carnegie Mellon, was working on. He gave me this video because he loves, he and I both love this because it shows kind of this weird dichotomy in where we are in technology. So what you're seeing is this is a field where this migrant worker is thinning trees. And so the idea is you have to actually pull the leaves apart and kind of pull out dead branches, and you want to kind of space everything apart to give everything room to grow. Doesn't, d does not take a rocket scientist to thin trees, but we actually need a human there to be able to understand what's dead, what needs to be spread, and how to do it. But the actual, so it used to take a crew of a bunch of people to do this because you needed somebody to drive the truck down the rows of the field. So now what you're going to see is this is where automation is today. So we still need the probably $3 an hour migrant worker to actually thin the trees, but we have been able to get rid of the $10 an hour driver of the vehicle. And I like to show this to the medical community because really what this shows us are the problems that we're having with perception and dexterity. Perception is the key issue for all robotics, what, no matter what field you're in. How do you know that the environment around you is what it is? I mean, how do we know that that, that leaf is the right one that needs to be either pulled or left alone? And this is why we still need surgeons today because we need the human eye to assess a situation to actually then trigger those rules and the knowledge that it takes. So we have to get better at perception. The other big problem is dexterity. You know, there are hundreds, of uh, thousands of researchers right now trying to automate our fingers, right? And this is actually why you see so many tools on uh, the Da Vinci because we still have not been able to figure out how to replace what is still one of the most amazing human attributes and it's, it's our ability to use our fingers but in concert with our eyes 
which is actually our brain, right, which is the mechanism for perception. So don't get too nervous yet. Now, a couple of other gotchas with this technology. So in the United States, about three years ago, we had a problem where a couple of pilots um, overflew Minneapolis. I don't know if you knew this in the news. And um, they basically just, they said they were talking. I actually believe there was some sleeping going on in the plane. Uh, because they had the plane on autopilot, and they just forgot to, to do their approach and land, and they were basically MIA, missing in action for about 45 minutes. And it was a huge you know, outcry in the United States. What is going on with those pilots? They're so unprofessional. No, they're not. I'm a pilot. I've got lots of friends in the airlines. It's maddeningly boring. It is so boring. The flights from England to the, to the United States are the most boring for humans. There's nobody to talk to. I can guarantee you there's a lot of angry birds playing going on in the cockpits. In fact, that picture of the pilot, this is, he's wearing a nap strap. It was actually, it's a device you can still buy. It's the strap that you can actually hook to the chair behind you to hold your head up so your head doesn't bob. So I did an interview with Wired Magazine and I referenced this. Um, and I said, look, you can go to the nap strap website. And, and they're advertising with a pilot what you can do with it. The next day, it disappeared from the website. So if you want the picture, email me and I'll send it to you. Now, the funny thing is we kind of laugh about uh, pilots and, boy, it's really boring. And we've got autopilot. But guess what else is really boring? Anesthesiology. Falling asleep for anesthesiologists, it's been a long problem. There's been all kinds of research about should they or should they not be able to have music? What are we going to do about it? How can we make it more interesting? You know, I propose to you, first of all, you know, there, and this is actually going to become more of a problem. The more automated technologies that we bring on, online in all aspects, the more that this is going to be a problem. And earlier, I forget who it was that said they were talking about the command center idea for the hospital, which I have been, I think that's a fantastic idea, and I have been advocating for some time that you could actually have a few anesthesiologists handle multiple patients at the same time in a command center environment because they're not doing anything for 95% of their time and it would be better for them to be able to multitask than to do nothing at all. So we'll see whether or not that takes off. Okay, that's, the, that's what we call the low side of, the, of your workload curve. There's the high side too, which is you know, as you start to work more, you start to get overloaded and you make mistakes. I like to show this picture because it shows just exactly what we expect out of humans. I got, this, I got this curious email this morning from a researcher. Basically, can you tell me how much information uh, that a pilot can take before they get overloaded? I'm, I'm like, what do you want me, want me to give you that in Shannon's information theory? You, what, what, do you want that in, in ones and zeros? I mean, how, you know, how, how, I can tell you it's too much. It's too much because this is what we're doing to our people. This is an operations center for some military operations going on in a country near you. And this is one person's workstation. So they've got one, two, three, four, five, six screens, four keyboards, four mice, a couple of telephones, and probably the most, the most important display or input device here. Can anybody see what this is right here? It's a cowbell. Do you know why this person has a cowbell? Because it's so noisy there that when something really bad happens, you know, people are dying, they need to get some attention over here, the guy has to stand up and ring the cowbell to get, a, to get over all the alarms. It sounds like a Las Vegas showroom uh, on these floors of these operation centers. Not to be outdone, in, a control, uh, in an electric power grid station near you, in a country near you, this is a picture taken uh, from uh, ABB, who loves to show you that this is actually what their control systems look like. And if you remember, this is very similar to what the ones in the Northeast in the United States look like. And this is what happened when we had the, the blackout that pretty much shut down the whole Northeast a few years ago. A person could not understand what they were being shown here, and it, it led to the cascading effect, which shut down the Northeast power. Not to be outdone, this is the medical community. I just wanted to show your, your, your field jumped right in there with everybody else because, see, there's this, there's this idea that more information is better, that if we give people somehow more screens, that that somehow will make them a better performer. And this is the radiologist station of the future, which, funny, it looks a lot like this station up here, except that I will give the medical community, the company who did this, I'll give them kudos, because they actually got it down to one keyboard and one mice. So that was good. 
but this is supposed to somehow make the radiologist perform better. Now, we're not actually giving the radiologist any tools or any search algorithms necessarily. Somehow, we're just showing that person more data, which is going to make them a better performer. It's, it's, I could show you these same screens, by the way, in almost every walk of life, every industry, train, the mining community does the same thing. So we really have to, to understand that throwing more data at people is only going to make this a harder job, and people are going to make more mistakes. All right, and then last but not least, who's the expert? You know, this is, this is one of the things when I talk to groups like this, the one thing, I'm, I'm talking to you about where the future is going, automation is coming, it's going to actually, for, particularly for the medical world, it's going to need to be more of a collaborative engagement with automation. Doctors are going to have to be supervising the automation, understanding when the automation is not working. Nurse practitioners, I think, are going to start taking on a whole new role in terms of um, their interactions with technologies. But who's that person going to be, and what's that person going to look like? So for aviation, you know, Top Gun, man, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, if you want to be a fighter pilot, you were Tom Cruise. And when we, you know, you, and, and the parallel to the U.S. for doctors is House. You know, the obnoxious, annoying, but incredibly brilliant man who can always solve everything that, you know, it's always a human that, that makes the, that has that solution. In fact, you know, this metaphor we need to understand is changing. It's definitely, for the military, it's really this. You know, it's the revenge of the nerds. We are actually starting, we, you will see, and you will see it coming through medical schools and other technology insertion points. We are going to need doctors who don't have the ability to memorize massive amounts of information, which is still a major human limitation. We're going to need doctors who understand technology and can work with technology and understand how to leverage the technology to extend their capabilities instead of trying to be the one-man hero you know, that, that saves the world, which is true of both aviation and medicine. All right, with that, I'll take some questions. Is anybody awake? <laughs> so, so why the, the consistent fear of automation from a quality and consistency perspective? I mean, if you look at the manufacturing, you look at aviation, mm -hmm. you know, we could create certainly evidence much more compelling than the average clinical trial that it, you know, there's some definite advantages here and yet tremendous resistance. And I, I wonder if you'd look at kind of the organizational Behavioral side of this. So, I, I mean, there's clearly organizational elements to it. If you want to look at an interesting organizational study, uh, it's, it's interesting to watch the U.S. Air Force because UAVs, drones, were forced onto them. They never wanted them. And, in fact, every year they try to kill the funding for these programs. Yet, despite that, the U.S. Air Force is, has not now more unmanned pilots than it does manned pilots and more unmanned aircraft than, than manned aircraft. And which is amazing to me, it just goes to show you that that technology has so revolutionized a capability set that even in the face of a culture who is very, very resistant, it's still making some inroads. Unfortunately, I, medicine's not quite there yet to, to over that organizational pull. And beyond an organizational resistance, it, it really comes down to a fundamental human individual resistance. When I talk to pilots, it's amazing to me, because these are educated, well-trained people, uh, it strikes a chord in them. You know, there's a couple of FedEx pilots I may have to get a restraining order against because they just get so worked up over the fact that they're, that you could not, oh, you need me, you need me, you cannot, you, you, you cannot automate me, right? So I think that there's something there that, that strikes a chord in us that if we can be replaced by a machine, what does that make us, right? So, so I, think, I think we do have some of those problems, but I think the medical community has, has actually a bigger leap to make because it's such a human-centric and you know, I almost married a doctor, so I'm pretty familiar with them. You know, there is this doctor as all-knowing, this powerful, you know, this human touching human. And I think it's very, and, and there's a concept that we as the patient is very, we, we know this as a patient because we, know, we see it in the aviation community. There's a reason actually that there will never be a truly passenger drone. There will never be a plane where you get on it and there's no pilot 
and uh, and you just ride that plane. Why not? I mean, it's very we could the, technically that has that was done 20 years ago. We could do it, but it won't happen because of something called shared fate, and that means that humans want a pilot in the plane because that person is gonna share their own fate. So if they're going, if the plane is going down, that person's gonna do everything they can to save their life. There's a, there's a parallel to that in the medical community. You know, you're, put, you're putting your life in someone's hands, right? So for, particularly for surgery, you know, it's very hard for us to give it up that if something goes wrong, is it the, I don't want this machine killing me. Right, so I think there's a, there's a big media aspect to this too, and, and we don't understand that, you know, one of the things that makes surgical robots so fantastic is because they can actually do maneuvers that the human body, brain, and eye cannot, even aided, right? I mean, the, the size of the incisions, the ability to get very small instruments, I mean, these are just something that the humans, humans cannot do so as precisely, and so we, we, we will get to a point where we can do micro micro surgery uh, to fix problems that we would not have been able to do without these tools and without the uh, robotic elements, but it's going to it's going to be a while because it, we're going to be very resistant. And this actually goes back to the regulatory agencies. You can't actually start justifying these technologies until you establish the correct clinical trials and the measurement and the efficacy programs, and we're resistant to do that. So until we measure and demonstrate in a very objective way, which you know you could say it's it's kind of arguable now whether or not even in regular clinical trials, whether we're not we're doing it. You know, you're not gonna get statistical significance in surgical trials. The whole measurement process is gonna to have to come some other way, but we're not open to even discussing that right now. At least that's my opinion. In the United States. I don't know how it is in Europe. The question I'd really like to ask you is how did George Bush ever learn how to fly a plane? <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that hard. Yes, there's a lot of research going on in the United States and probably to a lesser degree over in Europe. Uh, lots of uh, research on something called judgment under uncertainty and even intuition. You would be amazed at how much the Department of Defense has sunk into the researching of intuition. You know, when you're, what is this gut instinct? How do you know it? What's it telling you? So I think that there is a recognition that there, there, that is a powerful human element. And in fact, that's why I have my lab, the Humans and Automation Lab, because we don't want, I, what, what you'll find in a lot of computer science and robotics community is they really are looking for a replacement. They think, I'm going to replace a human with this robot, like in the manufacturing world, particularly like in the warehousing elements. I recognize, at least our philosophy in my lab is, there are many, many aspects to life where you can't and shouldn't put the responsibility solely onto a machine, that you need the human because the human can provide the judgment and the experience and the intuition that, uh, uh, that you cannot codify. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe one day all this intuition research will lead to a set of algorithms that replicate intuition, but I feel pretty confident that that's not gonna happen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee that if technology uh, change and adoption to the situation of consumers, maybe that rapidly gets a bit longer than the doctor? Yeah, absolutely. I think in, in terms of particularly uh, basic health care, you're going to see these devices. I mean, it's already started where you can get all kinds of attachments to your iPhone to check your blood pressure and diabetes glucose monitoring. And I think that's a good thing. I think what we're going to do is we're going to shift much of the 
triaging of healthcare issues off to technology and put them back into people's homes and put them in, you know, back to their ability. And I think that's good because we don't have enough caregivers, at least in the United States. It's really going to help alleviate a lot of workload. I envision a time where you're, uh, you, you will get some, your iPhone will have some kind of tricorder device on it. It'll find something wrong with you. It'll send a message to your local pharmacy. There will be a communication in there. At some point, it will be signed off by some uh, super pharmacist, which is what they're going to become, because you're still going to need somebody to sign off on potential drug interactions. And in fact, they'll be almost the middleman of the doctor. You seeing the doctor will p potentially be cut out of the loop only for special exceptions, right? So this is one in the future. What is that going to look like? What are we What are we going to do about gen general practitioners, and how are they going to look? And are we going to create this new elite class of doctors because they're the ones who are only, are they all going to be the house doctors? We only need the doctors when there's complicated, multiple symptoms that we can't figure out for for potentially complicated illnesses. That's correct, because and, and you know and and people want to argue whether or not they want to argue whether or not that's the way it should be. But you know, I will come back and say that's the way it is. That's human nature, right? So instead of fighting it, instead of trying to come up with a media campaign to under to have the human understand, you know, let's just go with it. But what will that do for you in the future, right? You as a doctor, you're a smart guy. You, we can't have you just sitting around basically holding somebody's hand. You know, you're not a hand holder. That's not what we're. You know, it's not what you went to school for. So what will you do? You will actually become more of a technologist in the future. The you of the future. Maybe you're going to be reprogramming that thing, or maybe you're going to be working on technology developments because you know this is it's just not going to be enough for you just to to push the button. So. You know, I, that's why I, when we talk to these groups, you know, when we start thinking about the future, it's not this, the, it's not just shaping the tools we use. It's going to shape the organizations that we're in and the way that we define people's jobs. And we need to start really moving towards this interdisciplinary nature that one doctor maybe doesn't necessarily have to specialize in one very narrow part of tech, uh, part of the uh, medical world. Yeah, I absolutely think so. And, and when you think about these devices, what they're going to do is they're, this is where that drowning in data slide really comes into hand. So can you imagine when you have, you have this helicopter, this robotic helicopter going into an emergency situation, maybe picking up multiple casualties, all hooked to these devices, they are going, there's going to be an onslaught of data that then starts to come back to the caregivers at whatever triage unit. We are now, because of all these electrical, electronic devices, that drowning in data issue is just going to become worse and worse. And what are we going to do with that? And, and how are you going to be able to process that? Particularly for emergency care, you really got very limited time to, to basically understand. So are we going to have to have more uh, machine learning algorithms, for example, that go in and detect trends? And how, but one of the things you're going to find out if you, as you spend more time in this world, machine learning, which is really just another name for artificial intelligence, a lot of these algorithms are really great for detecting trends in the data, but they can't assess goodness or badness, and they actually need a lot of supervision by humans to understand what that trend is. So 
the more robotics and the more artificial intelligence that we stick into these systems, the more knowledge and experience we're going to need for people to understand that. Unfortunately, we need people not with just knowledge and experience in medical conditions, but we also need people who understand the, how these algorithms work. And so this is actually why you know, in medical schools in 20 years, there's going to be a lot of computer science courses that are going hand in hand with the, your, uh, you know, your medical classes because you're going to have to understand how these systems reason and, and potentially some of the flaws in the information that they're giving you. Jan. Yeah, it's a great question, you know, uh, given the fact that, you know, the U.S. spends so much more on defense, both just general defense spending and defense research more than uh, other countries. But honestly, what you'll see is um, the R&D research and development spending from the defense agencies has may, been relatively flat for the past 30 years. And so it will move a little bit, but relative to the rest of the defense spending, it actually does not oscillate as wildly as the money for operational, you know, going to Afghanistan, for example. So I am actually not so worried about the defense spending because, you know, it might go down a little bit in the next year. Oh, but we'll get involved in some other war and it'll, sp it'll spike again, you know. So uh, that's not to me a major concern as it is for it, particularly in the U.S., the understanding from the National Institutes of Health of where this is going. So this talk I'm giving to you right now, I should give this talk to NIH. I'm actually on a panel for NIH and, you know, I, uh, kind of a, an advisor them. They never listen to me. You know, they've never asked me to come and give this talk to any of, of their high-level strategic people. The NIH has their, they're like an ostrich with their head so far down in the sand. The NIH wants to operate on what it has, how it has operated and how it thinks of clinical trials and that kind of research. And we want to push cancer and we want to push, you know, all the big, the, you know, stem cell research and whatnot, which I'm not saying we shouldn't invest money in there, but we have to stand back, and this goes back to the earlier comment I made about systems engineering. The medical community is growing, the technological footprint in the medical community is growing even with all this resistance, so it's coming. The problem is we don't know how to integrate it, we don't know what skill sets we need, we don't know how it's going to change, we have no planning for the face of the future, and it's those kinds of agencies, both NIH and, and worldwide, that need to start taking responsibility that technology, it's not scary, it's not foreign, it's actually something that they need to adopt a clear technology line of research instead of leaving it. Because what they do, what in the US, what happens is in at the National Science Foundation and NIH, they will say just what you said, oh, we'll just leave it up to the defense industry to fund that. But that's very haphazard. And you know, the defense industry has done a good job on you know, funding the medical evacuation research. But I guarantee you, they're not going to get in there and de develop the real clinical trials that we need for da Vinci, for example. So where does that leave the gap? That leaves a gap for companies. And, you know, I know that there, there are commercial companies' uh, representation in the room, so I'm not knocking them, but that's, that is just not a healthy balance of technology development when it's purely coming from companies because companies have their own objective functions to maximize their profit, right? So that's what we need that, but we also need that in the presence of either government-funded research or university independent research that is actually able to verify that. And that is the scientific method that we know that's worked well in the past, but we need to keep moving that forward, uh, uh, particularly for medical technologies. Absolutely. I mean, and, and it was the program was designed with that in mind. We feel like it's going to revolutionize first responders' uh, jobs in general, whether or not we're talking about air ambulance or uh, going in after a flood or a typhoon or something like that and rescuing people. So, uh, and one of the problems in the United States, 
I know it's a problem here in London uh, because I recently saw the accident of general aviation. For example, there was a helicopter that, remember, and it was bad weather in London and it flew into that crane, um, killed all those people. Uh, it's, it's a well-known fact that air ambulance services and general aviation in, in general in the United States has a very high accident rate that's actually stayed that way for about the last 20 years. It hasn't gone down at all despite all kinds of safety improvements everywhere else in aviation. So turning that kind of flying over to robots is better for us sooner than later. Oh, wait, uh, yeah, well, so regular ambulances, the car, yes, presuming that the driverless cars fix their issues. No, the, it's kind of a, it, it's hard to, to grasp it in your head. It's actually a lot easier to automate flying than it is driving. And the reason is, is that because you don't have 30 other planes within two feet around you that you have, the, you know, the obstacle threat field is just not the same. And so we still, I, we will have cargo FedEx size UAVs a lot faster than we will have truly automated ambulances that can work in an unstructured environment. But, but one day we will. It's interesting because it, it's almost as if you read my mind in terms of some of the research funding that I'm personally going after right now. So some, some of the research funding that, that we were thinking about was um, looking at uh, basically automated health status detection in and around wherever, right? And our first target is going to be uh, elderly facilities, elder care facilities. Uh, and why? Because we think that's the biggest market right now. So I, I do think that there are researchers, you know, I know myself and other group, we're, we're looking into it, but I will tell you the real, the real problem, particularly in the U.S., with moving your, your really fantastic roboticist, all your really top names of roboticists are not working in the healthcare field. Why? Because NIH doesn't fund it. Because when there, is, when there are grants, they're so tiny that they're, I mean, so really, in, in the healthcare field, like $50,000 is considered a, an amazing grant, you know, for, for medical technologies. You know, we're, we're talking, we're working in the five millions, you know, on, on a typical research grant for roboticists. So, you know, we're talking a couple orders of magnitude. So we can't, your, your real top talent is not jumping into that field. Uh, because it's, it's just not that useful, particularly if you're trying to get tenure. You know, I've got tenure now, so I can start doing the healthcare facilities, and, you know, I, I'm good. I can start, it, but it's my, this is, let me tell you, it's a hobby for me. Isn't that sad? I'm standing up, you know, I'm one of the pre premier researchers in this field, and I'll tell you, healthcare is a hobby for me that I dabble in when my career's not on the line. That is a sad state of affairs because, you know, we should have the reverse of that. We should, the defense industry should be my hobby, and I should, but I just can't because there's no money in it right now. So I think that, you know, and that's, but that's a much larger systemic problem that we're going to have to fix, not just at the U.S. regulatory, but I think that's kind of a worldwide view. Any more questions? All right. Thank you so much for having me. And you thought we were talking about iTech in the past two days. <laughs> now I feel like a dummy. Thank you very much, Misu. It was a very inspiring talk. So I think we get to the end to the closing remarks. And I really like to thank again our sponsors, Intel, ESP, and Microsoft. I need to thank all my colleagues that have worked really hard to put together this. All of you who are actively contributing to the whole discussion. I really enjoyed personally all the interactions we had yesterday and today. Let me just close with some key takeaways or some of the things that I heard that stuck with me. We started with a presentation that asked a simple question What is the future of hospitals going to look like? And we found probably some answers fewer doctors. 
was that's the turnaround. But then Bob Bell today reminded us patient safety is going to remain the primary goal. So no matter how fast technology is going to change, there are some clear business objectives that are going to guide the roadmap for business transformation and technology enabling that transformation. And then Dr. Mark Ladd told us that systemic changes are going to be the source of value in generating the real transformation, the double digit benefits, as he put it, from care coordination. So it's not about a mobile device or some collaborative technology. It is about the systemic effect of all of those and the business changes that are going to support that. And something that Steve said during one of the workshops, I'm paraphrasing here, it is not about designing our quality patient care networks. It's not about perfection, sitting down in a boardroom. It is about figuring out how doctors and how IT can enable preventing those patients having to go to the hospital and remain healthy. Mobility, somebody reminded us, is shifting the center of gravity outside of the hospital. And I think it was Jane during the panel that said that consumerization is actually tipping towards a more patient-centric and patient-empowered, I would say, environment. During the first panel this morning, we talked about decision support algorithm and pay for performance and incentives. They're only part of the pathway. What Arahola reminded us and Jenny reminded us and Dr. Zadeus reminded us during the white space panel. If you don't apply the appropriate cultural and organizational challenges, you're going to drop the hammer when it comes. It doesn't help to add the latest and brightest technology if you don't know how to use them and how to change some of the old behavior. And also, Jenny reminded us that it is increasingly important not to neglect investment in primary and community care in terms of professional capabilities. So if we want to keep people healthy outside of the hospital for the 340 days, there's much else that needs to be done in uh, outpatient, community care, home care, and so forth and so on. And then we had uh, a very inspiring talk from Nancy that helped us take a look at the future. The one thing that I'd like to uh, suggest is this is, this is just the beginning, probably, and hopefully, of a conversation that I'd like to keep going. We have some online social media facilities, but please feel free to reach out to us via email in any other way. Any type of feedback, don't forget your feedback form. Any type of comment, anything that can help us continue and keep this conversation going and build a better event for next year. We'll be more than happy. And don't forget, go out there and personalize, industrialize 